Thank you, Catherine and Dr. Velarde for inviting us here this evening. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm trying my best to not be intimidated by surrounding, <laughs> surrounded by all these women. So I did bring a, a, one of our residents here to keep me company. <laughs> Food is medicine. Think about that for a moment. We all have to eat. We do it numerous times a day. And um, it's sometimes associated with family gatherings and other social events. And we frequently are not conscious about the fact that what we put in our bodies really determines our health to a great degree. So if we eat lots of good food for us, we're likely to be healthy. Consequently, if we don't eat so much good food and we eat some of the bad foods, then we're not likely to be as healthy. So um, our presentation today is going to uh, be about 20 to 25 minutes long, and then we're going to have a lot of time for questions. But first, I'd like to ask you some questions. How many of you are associated with UF in, in some way? Just They tell me they well, can't hear over here. OK. So talk loud. Really loud. OK. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. I, I'm, I'm um, remembering that commercial on the, for one of the cell phone companies. Can you hear me now? OK. So we're going to, uh, uh, I'm going to start off and uh, come on here and talk for a few moments. And then Kayla is going to finish up, and then we'll have some questions. <laughs> So most of you are connected to UF. You're not patients here. Is that right? We're all, we're, we're all patients. We're all patients. So where do you get your information about nutrition? Internet. Magazines. Books. Pinterest. Okay. Do you, do, you, do you trust it, the information you get? Yeah. <laughs> what? Some, Some of it. How do you know what to trust and what not? Yeah, right. You don't. You have to try it. <laughs> do, yeah. Do any of you uh, familiar with the government guidelines for nutrition? What do you think of those? <laughs> Why is that? Yeah, so my recommendation is ignore those. <laughs> um, you know, it's part of our political system. When those guidelines were being developed, a group of scientists, experts, got together and came up with some recommendations. Those were turned upside down by the politicians and the lobbying interests. Uh, so a lot, of the, a lot of those recommendations are probably not sound. So it's hard to know what to trust and what to believe. And sometimes there's contradictory information, right? OK. I got two books here. One, they're both by experts in the field. How Not to Die. That's an interesting book. <laughs> I don't know if he has the magic, but uh, he, he does tell you about uh, living longer. And he's basically a vegan. He doesn't believe in eating. Um, dairy, and meat. OK, another book, Mark Hyman. Any of you heard of him? Mm -hmm. yeah. He's very popular. He, he gives conferences. He has books. He says, saturated fat is OK. And not only OK, it's good for you. And he's saying, don't eat it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what we're confronted with. and. Um, it's very hard to do research in nutrition because think about how we do it. We ask people what they eat and what diseases they get, and then we make an association. That doesn't necessarily mean that what they ate caused their condition. Right? It's very difficult to do controlled studies where you tell someone what to eat for a few years and follow them. It has been done, but it, it's very expensive and hard to do. So there's just a lot of information that we don't know. But what we're going to try to do today 
is talk about foods themselves and not particularly some of the fad diets. You can ask us questions about that if you want, but um, talking about the foods themselves. So what kind of diets are out there and which, what have you tried? Paleo. I'm sorry, I can't hear Paleo. Paleo diet, that's a popular <coughs> one. Keto. Keto diet, that's popular. California diet. <laughs> California diet. <laughs> What's the California diet? <laughs> South Beach diet. Mediterranean diet. Okay, so there are a lot of diets out there, and it can get really confusing about what you eat for what. Uh, so we're going to start with just food, if I can get this to work. Now, the concept that food is medicine is not new. Hippocrates said this thousands of years ago. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. He had it right. So we've gotten away from that. Because when we think of medicine, what do we think of? Pills, right? If you've got high blood pressure, take a pill. If you've got diabetes, take five pills. If you've got lipid disorder, take more pills. And I value these medicines. I think they've contributed a lot to um, our understanding of disease and our ability to treat chronic conditions. But, and here's the but, they um, all have side effects. And they're expensive. And food acts in the same way as medications do. They change your metabolism. They change the bacteria in your intestinal tract. They, they do a lot of the things. They act on the nervous system just like the medicines that you take. Um, so let's move on. This is what we'd like to do today. Um, I want you to understand the role of inflammation in the cause of chronic diseases. Um, and I'll get more into that, what we mean by that in a moment, because we, certain foods create this inflammation in our body, and certain foods counteract the in inflammatory response. And those are the ones that we want to concentrate on. Um, we want to learn, um, I want you to be aware of the basic components of evidence-based evidence diet plans, including the Mediterranean diet, DASH diet and plant-based eating. These are the diets that have been studied the most. And finally, and probably most importantly, because many of you probably know a lot of this information already, how do we incorporate that into our lives and make it easy and practical to eat it in a healthy way? So. Most chronic diseases we believe now are caused by this low-grade inflammatory response in our body. How many of you have, is this new or is this, have you heard of this? Yeah. Now, this is all mediated by the, our immune system in a complicated way, and we don't need to get into, into great details. But um, if, we, if you're eating a lot of those green foods on the right, you're inflammation in your body is decreased, and if you eat the, the, one, the cheeseburgers and fries on the left, you have more inflammation in your body. And this inflammation, we think, is the root cause of a variety of conditions, including heart disease and other vascular disease and cancer and Alzheimer's disease. Just about everything is related to this low-grade inflammation. So here are some of the things that affect this inflammatory response and what this inflammatory response causes. Um, one thing that's uh, it's not widely known, I think, is this gingivitis, which is inflammation of your gums. If you have gingivitis, you're much more likely to get heart disease. And this is because of the low-grade inflammation 
that occurs in your body in response to the bacteria in your mouth. Um, diabetes and Alzheimer's and various forms of arthritis, especially the inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis, intestinal conditions like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and vascular disease, all these things are, are basically caused from this inflammatory response. Now, we know that some foods uh, trigger this inflammatory response and some counteract it. Um, and we also are beginning to understand that the GI tract is really important in um, this process because as inflammation in the GI tract in increases, more toxins and, and irritants are allowed to pass through the bowel wall. Um, if, if you've heard this kind of gut health interaction, it's really pretty fascinating. Um, foods high in phytochemicals and antioxidants help reduce free radicals in the body and fight inflammation. By free radicals, we mean those, well, when we metabolize our, our food, um, certain chemicals are produced that, that are, we call free radicals as just a product of metabolism. And when that happens, um, the food we eat kind of gobbles up those free radicals and keeps them from doing damage. Finally, um, we talked a little bit about the, the microbiome in the prebiotics and probiotics, um, and this is connected to chronic disease. So I just wanted to introduce this concept of inflammation uh, as a root cause of, of chronic disease. Now, here are some of the foods that create this pro-inflammatory process and ones that counteract it. Let's start with the good guys first on the right side. These are vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, healthy fats, herbs and spices, and water. Those are the good guys. The bad guys are sugar-sweetened beverages, added sugars, and refined carbs. The refined carbs, remember, are things that are white, like white flour, white rice, those things, sugar. Processed meats, probably one of the number one things that I think are, are part of this inflammatory process. Solid fats, trans fats, <coughs> vegetable oils, except for the monounsaturated vegetable oils like what? Olive oil. Olive oil, right. So olive oil tends to be kind of neutral, maybe on the right-hand side, whereas all the other oils, safflower oil, the, the seed oils, sunflower oil, canola oil, those are the ones that um, are more likely to be pro-inflammatory. All fried foods, unfortunately, <laughs> are inflammatory. And we were talking on the way in here how we remembered fried chicken and how good it tasted. <laughs> Well, it's not so good for you, <laughs> but it's good. It does taste good. And finally, dairy. Now, dairy is somewhat controversial. It's my opinion that, that dairy is pro-inflammatory and um, should be either avoided or eaten in small amounts. I have a question. Do you yes. have to wait till the end? No. Okay. You can ask her. You have on the healthy side, like a healthy fat, and then you have a solid fat. Can you tell me the difference between the two? Yeah, a healthy fat would be olive oil. No, but you cook it in your food. You put it in salad, you, you put dressings and things like that. Whereas a, a, uh, a solid fat would be the, the fat in meat, for example. Lard. Or butter. Um, yeah. The fat and meat. Bacon. Okay, was there another question? Oh, yeah. 
Okay. I think I'm going to let Car Kayla, <laughs> Carla, <Yeah. I> know. <laughs> Kayla handle that one. Sure. Um, we're switching pretty soon anyway. So coconut oil, um, coconut oil. Yes, if it's a healthy fat or not. And that's a really good question. It's in the news. It's in the media right now. We see a lot about it. What's unique about coconut oil, especially as it fits into this slide, is when we talk about fats, typically solid fats, like your question, are fats that are solid at room temperature. And those tend to be saturated fats or the fats that we would say aren't good for your heart. So think of butter. If it's sitting on the counter, it's still solid. If you think of after you cook a hamburger or bacon, if you let it cool, it's solid. Then usually we would say our heart healthy fats are tend to be the liquids at room temperature. So olive oil would be your example. Coconut oil is unique because it is solid at room temperature, right? It's a higher percentage of saturated fats, but it is a plant-based fat. So it's very rare because most of our saturated fats are from animal products, while our unsaturated fats come from plants. What they're finding about coconut oil is that there are some suspected health benefits. It does seem to behave differently in the body than the solid fats do, um, like butter or lard, but there's still a lot of research to be done to show whether it is truly a heart healthy fat because it is predominantly saturated fat, while something like olive oil is going to be more unsaturated fats. Okay? Keep in mind that while we know there's a lot of health benefits to coconut, coconut oil is a processed product from the coconut, right? So when we process the coconut, we've lost the fiber, we've lost some of the nutrients that were originally in coconut. They're not in the coconut oil. So our bottom line, we kind of go both sides. Bottom line would be, if you like coconut oil, it's probably okay to use it some, use it in moderation, but it's gonna take more time for us to have enough research to see if you consume coconut oil often for a long time, how does that affect your health, your cholesterol, your heart health? So I wouldn't go out and swap all of your fats for coconut oil. I wouldn't put it in your coffee, but it might be okay to use if you like it in moderation and then we'll have to kind of keep watching because we don't really know until we get research back. Okay. One, one of the problems I have is that conflicting information mm -hmm. such as whole grains. Yeah. I read one thing that says, oh, whole grains are great. I read other things that say it causes inflammation and that it's gluten and all of that. So it's hard to know. Is it good? Is it bad? Does it cause inflammation? I, a lot of some of the diets, like the keto diet, discourage grains, uh, all grains. Um, but as with, it, it is somewhat controversial about what are the good grains. A lot of people have gluten sensitivity; they just don't tolerate gluten well. If that's the case, you shouldn't shouldn't eat it. Um, Gluten is, the, is a, a substance found in, in wheat, mainly wheat, but other grains too. Uh, but most, most studies have found that whole grains are part of a healthy diet. That oats, for example, they absorb fats from your intestinal tract. They don't absorb it. They, they kind of adhere to it. And so those don't enter into your body. So... They do lower your lipid levels a little bit, um, but I think that um, health, whole grains especially are part of a healthy diet. What do you think? I would agree. All I would really add to that is, and this is a helpful distinction for me, they've started using the term intact grains as another way to think of grains because as soon as whole grains became popular, what happened? Yes. We took whole wheat flour and put it in everything, like frosted flakes and cookies and crackers, and said they were whole grain. But if we look at our list, those foods are absolutely going to count as refined carbs, added sugars. If we think of intact grains, which when we talk about whole grains, is probably mm. more what we're referring to. We're going to be thinking of grains as close to that original form as they could be. So the oats or brown rice or quinoa would count as intact grains. And we do know there's a lot of benefits to those foods um, with fiber and a lot of other nutrients. One other disclaimer we probably should have made at the beginning was most of what we're saying is, of course, general nutrition advice for a large group. So if you have, as most of us do, your own medical history, 
Um, some things we say may not be specific for you. So there are, of course, health conditions where you've reached a certain point that you'd have to follow further restrictions. And if you had any of those questions, you should, of course, talk to your own doctor or seek personal advice. But today is more general. Okay. Sorry. Diabetes educator had a to say A question that I meant to ask. <laughs> <laughs> when you go to your doctor, do you talk about nutrition? A few yeses. Let's, let's do hands. How many feel like their doctor really is interested in nutrition and talks to them in a meaningful way? How many feel that they're not? About half and half. Mm -hmm. There was a, a study recently that, that showed about only 20% of people feel like their doctors are knowledgeable about nutrition and talk to them about it. So that's pretty discouraging. And um, that includes cardiologists. And gastroenterologists. And gastroenterologists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I beg your pardon? Tell, tell your doctor what's going on with you, and they pop the pill. They tell you. Yeah. It takes much more, much more time to talk to you about how you're eating than to, say, take this pill. So I encourage you to ask your doctor when you go um, about questions that you might have. The more questions they get, the more knowledgeable they will become. Do you want to die? <laughs> it's also, it's very helpful. It's very helpful as a reference book. So it's written chapters based on different nutrients and conditions. So you could just look at the and, parts you needed. And there's a lot of repetition in there too. And he has a website with blogs. Actually, you can sign up for his website and they, they send you videos um, every, a couple times a week. Uh, they're evidence-based. He, what he does is review the published literature in, in medicine about nutrition, and he puts it in, into his perspective. Uh, his name is Grieger, G-R-E-G-E-R, -E -E Michael Grieger. And the website is Medical Facts. I think it's Nutrition Facts. Nutritionfacts.org. Okay. Good. Okay, you want to? Sure. Okay. Good. Hand oh. off here. <laughs> okay, so going forward, and question? Yeah, For sure. One, no, go ahead. That's the whole point. Okay, I, I actually have two questions. Okay. One, I saw the process. Yes. Is that considered... Um, like your sandwich meat over by the bacon and bacon and stuff like that. And also, is it considered your deli meat? And mm -hmm. would you do better, like, say, if I want to eat turkey, I'd do better buying a turkey, baking the turkey, and slicing it myself? Or mm -hmm. do you get the same from deli meat? Like, sure. You have to Excellent slice question. Yeah. It's a great question. So that's question one. That's okay, let's do that first. Don't lose your okay. second one. So when we talk about processed meats, those are typically going to include uh, meats that have a lot of sodium added to them and go through some form of processing. So think of a lot of pork-based meats, bacon, sausage especially, um, lunch meats, cold cuts, ham, even turkey, bologna, um, hot dogs, thank you, absolutely would all fit into that category. Okay, typically they're meats that have the salt or sodium added to them as well as nitrates or nitrites in the process of producing right, them. I, I guess what I was trying to ask yes. is, what, what do you do? is your bag of sandwich meat? Are usually more options. Now those can be more expensive and we know that's a trade-off, but there are some brands uh, like Boar's Head is a pretty popular one that specifically make lower sodium processed meats. Sometimes if you go to the deli and you're getting it fresher, there are going to be less of the nitrates and nitrates added than in the bagged meats that keep for three months. Right. Usually the longer something lasts, the more preservatives there are in it. Um, so that would be a healthier choice. Baking your own turkey and using it for sandwiches would be amazing. Right. Well, I do it with chicken. That's wonderful. Not realistic for everyone. So if you can, that's super. Um, if not, even maybe looking at other options for sandwiches, truthfully, um, even like a tuna, a tuna salad or peanut butter, or if you can, the lowest, mm -hmm, 
the lowest sodium um, lunch meat you could find or a brand that says on the label that it's nitrate free would probably be your best bet. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, now my other question okay. is about the, the sugar, the refined sugar. Okay, mm -hmm. everything is, you know, it is, it isn't, it is, it isn't. All this is good for you, it's not good for you. I read recently that they were saying, I read an article that mm -hmm. said that the most healthy sugar that's not refined is coconut sugar. And okay. I hadn't really heard of that. Yeah. But I've also heard that all maple syrup is good mm -hmm. in raw honey. You know, okay. soy yeah. bean. And those, so kind of what to make of that. The question was about sugars, um, like refined sugar versus coconut sugar or honey or maple syrups. Okay. Um, so again, keeping in mind that with different medical histories, the answer to this would be very different. In general, sugar is sugar in the body. Now that sounds kind of harsh, but you know, so our honeys or our like natural maple syrup, they're definitely going to be less refined than the white table sugar. But the bottom line is when we consume them, our body is processing that as glucose. And for most of us, if we use much of it, that will lead to more sugar and more calories from sugar than we need. Okay, now, if you are going to use something to sweeten it, I, this is just personally, I would say bottom line is the amount you use. So whether it's coconut sugar or white sugar or honey, we need to be cautious how much we're adding to our foods. Um, if you have no you know, pre-existing medical conditions that would influence it, I would say using something like honey or maple syrup probably lines up more often with individuals who are making other health conscious choices. So when we look in the research, we probably see that correlate, that people who use honey or maple syrup might be healthier. Again, back to how we interpret nutrition research, I don't know that we can attribute it to the honey or the maple syrup, but usually if we're thinking really hard about what kind of sugar we're gonna use, we're also thinking really hard about other healthy choices we make, so would likely be healthier in general. Yeah. Um, but bottom line, they would still, honey, um, some people would not put on the pro-inflammatory list, but I would still be cautious with how much you use. Yeah. Now, Dr. Grieger has a, an example of how he sweetens food. He takes dates, whole dates, um, mm -hmm. puts hot water on them, and puts it in a food processor, and it's called date sugar. So you're getting the sweetness from the date, but you're also getting the, all, the, all the fiber from the, mm -hmm. from the dates and the other nutrition besides sweetener, but besides just the sweet taste. So you're getting nutrition in addition to sweet. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll keep going. Feel free to keep asking questions as we go. Um, this graph, I just still love to look at it because it shows, it was from 2012, but it shows in the United States, how the majority of people are eating. So you'll see on the graph that the red section, 25% is animal food. That would include all meats, eggs, dairy, seafood, animal products. The yellow section is processed foods, which is gonna include refined grains, things that have lots of ingredients, added sugars, um, refined fats. And then the green section, 12% is plant food. And the crazy thing is, if you look at that note that's hard to read, it tells you that even up to half of that 12% um, can be in processed foods. For example, nuts and a Snickers bar are still getting, <laughs> truly. So we could even probably just make that 6%. So I always like to show this because you don't need Dr. Halpern or myself to interpret this for you, do you? What are we eating too much of? Yeah. And what are we not eating enough of? Plant the plant foods. So we're done, and we're going home, and that's all you need to know, right? Um, but in some ways, it really is that simple, is if you took nothing else away from tonight except that you were going to increase the amount of whole, real plant foods you ate at every meal, and you were going to decrease how much you ate of the foods that come in packages with long ingredient lists and lots of sugars and flours, that would be a really impactful change you could make, okay? I just want one comment from that. Yes. Go ahead. Now, with the animal food, what if you kill your own and eat it? It's not yeah. processed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get your own fish. Yes. Eat it. It's not processed. It's not processed. I, I'm married to a hunter. So <laughs> <laughs> we get pork. We get yeah. meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that kind of launches into a whole other thing that will probably come up later kind of with our food supply and how food and meat is grown and harvested here. I would say it's definitely better if you're getting that meat yourself, hunting it, catching it, I'm not sure. 
Um, that's much better than a lot of the processed okay. meats. Um, bottom line, in the United States, we're still eating too much animal food. And that's agreed upon across the board. We're not trying to make everybody go vegan, but everybody would agree we're eating too many animal foods and not enough yeah. plant foods. Yeah, there, there have been studies throughout the world where people in distant lands had their native diet, which was mainly a plant-based diet, usually. Um, and when, they, when these people immigrate to the U.S. and start eating this diet, they get the same diseases that we Americans get, that, they're, that are almost unheard of in their, in their native countries. And a lot of that is probably diet. Some mm -hmm. of it may be um, stress and le less activity and things like that. But the diet clearly uh, mm -hmm. is impactful. Yes. I see about plant food, and mm -hmm. I hear a lot about soy. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things. I've heard a lot of good things, and yes. I hear a lot of bad things. Yes. So how is soy? That's a great question. So the question was about soy and kind of where it fits into this. Um, soy is going to fit into the plant foods. Now, even within the world of soy, we have lots and lots of processed soy, and we have things that would be considered more like whole food soy. Um, everything I've seen in red has been to encourage those choices. So, for example, true soybeans like edamame, if you've seen those, they're really easy to add in to dishes, rice, stir fries. Um, even soy milk is considered, if we're doing the unsweetened, considered um, a great source of soy protein. A lot of recommendations would say that up to 25 grams of soy a day is safe for women. There's been some controversy or concern for females who have a history of estrogen-based cancers with soy. And so I'm going to be cautious what I say there, but I will say a lot of new research is saying soy is okay even for those women. If you don't have a history of the reproductive cancers, soy has been shown to be protective from them. Do you have anything to add to that <laughs> question? Um, no, I think that that's okay. true. You, the, Tofu. There, there's a chemical called phytoestrogens mm -hmm. in soy, and it's not really an estrogen. It doesn't stimulate reproductive tissue like mm -hmm. uh, estrogens do. Um, and most recent research is that it's safe. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. But that, again, is very different than the really delicious, sweet protein bars that have chocolate and soy protein powder in them. That's not like a whole food soy. Yeah. So we would kind of rank that below Again, the, the whole food soys like tofu, edamame, soy milk. And you can process soy too, like certain, certain mm -hmm. proteins and adding lecithin to it, mm -hmm. and then it makes it kind of like a meat, mm -hmm. a processed meat. Yep. Um, yeah. So if you have Hashimoto's, you're supposed to not eat soy products at all, anything to do with soy. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know enough to be able to tell. That's that's a condition of the of the thyroid that it causes inflammation. Um, I would have to look something up about that. I don't. I can't. I can't give you a good answer to that. Can you? We can easily look into it and get back to you. But I would say if you're yeah, then, then it's, it's perfect. I guess the, the answer that might be helpful would be you don't have to consume soy. Yeah. So if you have read from reputable sources that's the correct diet for that and are not interested in soy, perfectly fine to avoid. Yes? What about those soy products that are like Morningstar that kind of like Yep. So unfortunately, that's another good example of a health food that still fits into the processed food categories. And when we look at them, a lot of them are going to be high in sodium, have added fats, have random added carbs and fillers added in. So does this mean you should never consume them? You know, if you were trying to follow a plant-based diet and you needed a convenient option once in a while, of course. I don't think eating it once a week or a couple times a week even would cause harm, but that's not going to give you the health benefits that have been researched by consuming soy. As far as I'm aware, tofu falls into one of the like higher quality um, sources of soy. Mm -hmm. 
Another source of soy is tempeh, mm -hmm. which is fermented soybeans. If you look at tofu, it looks very homogeneous, mm -hmm. white glob <laughs> that <laughs> wiggles. Uh, tempeh is, uh, you can actually see the beans in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's fermented, which Great. may have certain Other health benefits. Probably. benefits. Yeah. Good, okay. Great questions. So what we want to do now is just talk um, briefly or in depth, based on questions, whatever we need to, about some of the different evidence-based, they're called diets, but we don't really like to call them diets, more eating plans. Um, and then as questions come up, we can talk through those. These are not the only healthy ways to eat, but like Dr. Halpern mentioned at the beginning, they are the most um, researched. So there's a lot of new stuff. The dieting industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, so there will always be new diets. We all want the easy, and I don't, I don't say that in a negative way, I do too. We're all seeking health and wanting ways to be healthier, so those things catch our attention. But until they've been around and have really stood that test of long-term sustainability and effectiveness, they're, they're not really worth your time. So we want to go through some that are worth your time, okay? And who's heard of the Mediterranean diet? Yay, okay. So this is by far um, probably the best research and one of the most effective proven ways to eat that it's good for your heart, as well as your blood pressure control, healthy weight maintenance, just all kinds of benefits. And so what you'll see if you're looking at the screen is um, the Mediterranean pyramid. Is kind of, it's based on the same concept of the old school USDA pyramid, which was that what's at the bottom is what you should eat the most of. As you move up to the top, it's what you should eat less of. Okay, so when we look at the Mediterranean diet, one thing that's interesting is before we even get to the food, it's based on a foundation of physical activity and enjoying meals with others or healthy social engagement. So you guys are doing one of those tonight already. Everyone's here together eating. That's good. Um, and this is, we're not going to go too far into it tonight, um, but you'll see in these healthy lifestyles again and again that there's healthy social relationships and of course there's more active, less sedentary lifestyles. <clears throat> But the foundation of the Mediterranean diet is plant-based. So it's not a vegan diet, meaning that you can follow a Mediterranean diet and still eat chicken, fish, animal products. You can follow a Mediterranean diet and be completely vegetarian or completely vegan. It's very flexible. It's not a rigid diet. They're principles. But it's based on plants. And when we talk about plants, what, fo what foods are we talking about? Yeah. So vegetables, fruits, the whole grains or intact grains would count, beans, legumes, nuts, seeds, avocados, all of those good foods. The Mediterranean diet is based around them. So when you think of your meal, that's what the focus point of the meal is, okay? So in the South, when we plan a meal, what do we plan first? Meat, meat. absolutely. You think, what's the meat? Usually, what's the next thing? Starch, yes. And finally, so if this was our plate, we probably would have like our meat or our starch, right? And then some more meat or starch, and finally maybe a little section of vegetables that a lot of times would actually still be a starch, yeah. right? Um, so this is really a different way of thinking when you would ask yourself when you're planning the meal, well, what plants am I going to eat? So meat's kind of the afterthought if you choose to eat it in the Mediterranean diet. Mostly plants, next thing up would be fish and seafood, so most protein um, is going to be coming from marine sources. Salmon, um, what are other fish or seafood that we like to eat? There's a lot around Florida. Yeah. Yep. Shrimp are fine. Good. Tuna, all of those are good options. We would encourage you in Mediterranean eating to eat them at least two or three times a week, but you could absolutely eat them every day. Okay. Next step up covers poultry, eggs. Was that a question? Poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt are moving up toward the top of the pyramid, so they're there if you choose to eat them, but it would be smaller amounts, um, which is a little different. A lot of us think of like the white meat chicken as the healthiest meat to eat all the time, and it's here in the Mediterranean diet, but it is gonna be encouraging fish over that. And then up at the very top, we have meats, meaning red meat, um, beef, pork, lamb would fit into that category, and sweets. So at the top of the pyramid would be that you can have them sparingly, once in a while, but for all of us, that's going to be a healthy choice to be trying to eat less of that, okay? The Mediterranean diet, of course, encourages water, and there is red wine, right? <laughs> <laughs> Questions about that before we go on, because there's almost always one. Yes? 
as it says it drink water and wine mm -hmm. in moderation yes and, in your, and on the other hand mm -hmm. it's supposed to drink a lot of water Yes. So the wine is the in moderation. <laughs> <laughs> Not the water, yeah. That's, no, and that actually is a great clarification for that point on the slide. Drink water, I should pause, and wine in moderation, yes. Did we get that recorded? <laughs> okay. Yes, exactly. There should, we, will, we will edit that. So lots and lots of water, if you drink alcohol, Red wine is the only alcohol that's really been shown to have some health benefit. We should note that there's not proven benefit, if you're someone who doesn't drink alcohol, there's not proven benefit in adding alcohol because there's a lot of benefits to avoiding it as well. Okay, but of all the alcohols, if you're going to, there is a lot to support that regular, reasonable, in moderation consumption of red wine can be heart healthy. <clears throat> yes? Do certain red wines have more sugar? The, um, what would they be, like the port wines, the dessert wines are higher the in sugar? Zinfandel, I think, is high in, yeah. in sugar. Is that red? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how significant it is. We'd, I'd have to look into that. But they would, in theory, still have the benefit of the resveratrol in the red wine. Yes. That's excellent. I mean, they, they take the alcohol out? They're just the grapes. They're dry, the dried grapes, as in raisins? Well, they're not, yeah, I guess they're the grapes specifically made for certain wines. Excellent. Yeah. It's so maybe a little better of a flavor there. Yeah. I mean, they even have them in dark chocolate covered in, but they have less inflamed. Ooh, now we're getting. <laughs> we can ruin anything, right? <laughs> yes, in moderation. I agree. I agree. Good question. Okay, good. And honestly, even just eating grapes gives you a lot of the same nutrients that you get in wine, but not as fun. Yes. Would you like to answer that question, Dr. Halpern? What's the question? Fish, quality, yeah. how it is farmed, grown, caught. By all means, if possible, eat wild-caught fish. Farm-raised farm fish are fed corn, meal, and substances that they feed animals. And so you really turn a, um, a fish into, into a cow yeah. that swims. Uh, certain fish are almost always farm-raised, like tilapia. I don't know about the salmon that we ate tonight. I, it's probably farm raised. It's it, wild caught salmon is more expensive. There's no yeah, doubt about that, though. and seasonal. Um, so, um, what's really important when you're considering any kind of meat, uh, animal protein is what is the animal eating. So, if the fish are eating corn, that's not. <laughs> as good as a fish eating what they eat, plants, they, another fish, you know, what, they, what they usually eat. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you are eating meat, then buying organic meat that doesn't have any additives like um, antibiotics and hormones is far better um, than, um, yes. Yeah. Well, they will say sometimes no additives. Um, cage free, that is a term that means that they're not crowded together in a cage. It doesn't, free range means that they're running around. That's probably the best thing to eat. Pasture raised. Free range. They call them that too. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Isn't that transferred into the eggs? Yes. So, how do I, so, so the only thing I can discern about eggs is 
Oh, you, you, it, it will say no, ad, no antibiotics added or no, no hormones added. Mm -hmm. but there, that means the chicken not be ready to sell. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Well, that that means the, yes. Okay. Yeah. That the the chicken was healthy before <laughs> she laid the eggs. <laughs> Any other questions about this? Because there's a lot of confusion. Wait, 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 wait. Take your two. You have fresh water fish and you have salt water fish. One better than the other? The ones that have the most omega 3 fatty acids are probably best. Those are the, the cold water, cold water, cold water, cold water fish. Cold water mm -hmm. fish salmon, tuna, mackerel, cod. Mm -hmm. And they're usually. Um, have more of a color to the flesh. Question back here before we go on? Cold water, yes. I think, well, yep. Mm -hmm. I thought it was next to you. So I could wait if this is too much of a leap, but um, the fat versus sugar being the really bad guy, um, I've read a lot of articles um, about, you know, I don't know, decades ago, there mm -hmm. was kind of a big, not conspiracy, but anyway, mm -hmm. heavy lobbying effort yeah, absolutely. Um, to buy <clears throat> sugar to make fat be the bad guy, mm -hmm. and that the research is that like sugar is really the bad, bad guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I understand you're presenting a balanced yes. uh, you know, mm -hmm. thing, but do you have an opinion mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. newer wave of information that's coming out that's saying, Hey y'all, uh, you know, just eat the full fat yogurt kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, yeah. Thoughts? Yeah, I do. Do you have thoughts? Go ahead. Okay, you're absolutely right. As far as if we look through kind of the trend of food, a lot of it is pushed by lobbying, or call it a controversy. I'm okay with that. Um, to, to really villainize fat, so we had the low fat trend where you know Skittles were okay because they had no fat in them. And then more recently, there's been more and more, and then we went through low carb, yeah. kind of leading into now where there is a lot um, pointing out the health consequences of sugar. So I would say, kind of, I don't mean this to be a cop-out answer, but I think if you're taking either of those nutrients and isolating them and putting them in processed foods, you're going to get the health consequences. So I don't think personally that we should take fats and put them in everything or consume a lot of um, the, the uh, like animal fat foods in high amounts, but I also think that sugar um, has a lot more health risks and consequences than previously considered. So I think that your concern is valid. I think if you focus overall on avoiding those processed foods, unless you have specific health conditions that would make someone counsel you otherwise, I personally at this point wouldn't be over concerned with full fat dairy, for example, to give you a straightforward answer in small amounts. No. Yeah. I, I'd agree. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hyman and Dr. Grieger <laughs> and Dr. Halperin. <laughs> I don't have a book yet. Yes. Yes. Agree that sugar is, added sugars are bad. And it, it, you could include artificial sweeteners in that category yes. as well. Um, one and then two and then three. Yeah. Gotcha. So um, avoid sugars. Now, processed sugars, not natural processed sugars. Pro yeah. Processed sugar. Fruit's fine. Mm -hmm. Fruit's good because it has fiber in it and it's not absorbed as rapidly. You, mm -hmm. your, your insulin levels are lower. Thank you. Hold on. Yeah. Correct. We have a question back here. I see you. Yes, you were waiting first. I'm leaving a whole, a lot of times I'll read labels, and if I can't pronounce it, I try not to eat it. Yep, that's a great rule of thumb. There's, if anyone wants another book recommendation, a quick funny read, Michael Pollan is a food journalist, and he wrote this little book. Um, he's written several. The Omnivore's, Omnivore's Dilemma, Dilemma 
is the one, and he has lots of just really good, practical, funny rules of thumbs to follow, and one of them is if your grandmother couldn't, if your grandmother didn't know what that ingredient was, don't eat it. If you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. And those are, those are helpful ways to take yeah. the concepts and bring them into kind of your day-to-day -day life. Michael Pollan, just a second. We had someone over here waiting, and then you had a question as well. Yes. Personally, I do not think there's a lot of ongoing research to support the concern about lectins. A lot of the foods that are in them, we do know, like beans and legumes and whole grains, we have a lot more research to say there's health benefits to those foods than research right now saying that lectins are, are dangerous. Yeah. Again, just th that would be my yeah. personal interpretation. And Dr. Hyman is not a real fan of of, of those things. Either. Correct. And paleo diet also being one of the more popular diets, that's the other thing is you'll find paleo diet does say to avoid um, legumes and grains. Yeah. I, I'd like to add one other thing to the yogurt question that sugar is added to most yogurt True. and it's very, if you take out the fat to make it taste decent, they add sugar. And uh, so I'd be very cautious about that. Plus the whole um, idea of whether dairy is inflammatory or not is, is controversial. I know that Kayla and I have some difference of, of opinion I here. She I'll admit it. <laughs> she can have it. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I, uh, I have a lactose intolerance, so I, I don't, I don't uh, eat dairy products. But uh, th the way that I've interpreted the mm -hmm. literature mm -hmm. Uh, I am leery of a lot of dairy. And that is a great point about the sugar, that if you could buy plain, so looking for things that don't have the added sugars, that would be a much better choice if you were going to consume yeah. it. What about raw sugar? Raw sugar is sugar. It's less refined, but as far as how your body processes it, it's processed the same way. It's going to cause the same spike in blood sugar. So there's not, um, it's really more of a preference or a flavor, but we can't think of it as a healthy addition. Well, I mean, like, like myself, I just got so tired of just everything. I'm like, I'm just going to have plain old sugar in my coffee. I have two cups yeah. a day, that's it. And if it's, it's in moderation, day, only, that could yeah, be a reasonable it's, choice. Some days only have one. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't drink any yeah. sodas or anything like that. So. Sure. If it is okay, we might hold questions just for 10, because I know we're getting close to 7, 10. Yeah. It's 10 after 7. Yeah. So, so we don't have too much left. Sure. And we want, this is what we want to do is answer your questions, but I think if we get through a couple more slides, some of them might be answered, and then we'll kind of take a lot of questions at once, if that sounds good. Okay. Oh, we didn't do that one. Oh, got it back. Okay. So briefly, um, the DASH diet stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. This is specifically um, a therapeutic diet that's been shown to lower blood pressure. So one that does have general health benefits but targets a specific condition a little bit more. Um, what you'll see is a lot of things in common with Mediterranean in that it really encourages fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. But here's one of the big differences. DASH diet not only says it's okay, but it encourages low-fat dairy. And we've already been around the dairy controversy. Some would say no dairy. Some would say don't do the low-fat. Um, but DASH diet adds to the confusion <laughs> by saying that you can include it as part of an overall healthy diet, partly because of the added benefit of calcium that you're getting and potassium from the dairy. The DASH diet, though, kind of agrees with Mediterranean and plant-based eating and that it would tell you to limit red meat, um, animal products, processed meats, and then the sugars and sweets. Okay, so we've got that that agrees. Um, there's different levels to how severely you restrict your sodium intake, and all I would really like to mention about that is a lot of us, who's been told to be on a low sodium diet? Because it gets pretty common as we get older, okay? So if you have any family history of high blood pressure, you've probably heard that. Um, even if you don't have high blood pressure, we know that we're taking in too much sodium in our country, and that's mostly coming from processed foods. So when people talk about not eating a lot of sodium or salt, first thing most of us think of is the salt that we add when we cook, which is fair. 
but most of our sodium intake, they say 70 to 75 percent, comes from the processed food, so it's already in the foods we're eating. So this just agrees with kind of a theme we've been talking about, that the more we avoid those processed foods, naturally, the less sodium you'll be consuming. Okay, I mean, it's in breads, it's in milk, it's in crackers, it's in canned foods and frozen pizzas and TV dinners and crazy amounts. So the more that we eat real foods, they do have small amounts of sodium, but they're much, much, much lower levels. Okay? And then we've talked kind of around this one as well tonight, but plant-based eating is very, very well supported by research. Now, this may not be the most sustainable diet for everyone, but for many individuals, this can have dramatic, um, dramatic effects on your health. A lot of our chronic diseases can be improved or controlled with a plant-based diet. As with anything, it's very possible to be a vegetarian who eats lots and lots of sugar. For example, sugar's vegetarian, sugar's vegan, right? So we can cheat anything. <laughs> we know that's true. But if we're looking at a true plant-based um, diet or vegetarian diet, you should be eating a lot more of your whole foods, plant foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, seeds, healthy fats. And you're going to be, if you're vegan, avoiding all animal products. That's what we mean by vegan. So no milk, dairy, meat, um, eggs, yeah. right? If you're going to follow a vegetarian diet, there's different forms of that, but typically you'd be allowing eggs and dairy. Pescatarian would be allowing fish, and flexitarian is just a cool name if you follow a vegetarian diet sometimes, which is valid. I think it's valid. There's a lot of health benefits. If you do Meatless Monday, you can claim flexitarian, okay? Um, but just like this pyramid shows you, even if you're following a vegetarian or vegan diet, the majority of what you eat should be fruits and vegetables. Going up the pyramid, there is a place for the intact grains, beans, soy products, nuts and seeds, herbs, spices, healthy fats. And at the top, if you were following more of a vegetarian option, you could be eating eggs, fish, animal products, but even then would be in smaller amounts. Okay, now this is very different than like um, right now, some of the really high protein, really low carb diets are very popular. This is almost the exact opposite. You will be eating a lot more carbohydrates if you follow a vegetarian or vegan diet. But the bottom line is the quality of the foods that you're eating, the nutrients that are in them, are health promoting and are anti-inflammatory, okay? And very well supported by research, um, but may not work for everyone. There's not a perfect diet for everyone, um, but what you'll see is of all the things we've talked about tonight, there are underlying themes that they all have in common. And you guys know what those are by now. So what of Mediterranean, DASH diet, vegetarian diet, what are some of the trends or the themes that they all have? <clears throat> yeah. They could read. Yeah. yeah. Less, I heard processed foods, less sugar, less meat. Those are all absolutely true. All of these eating plans are going to prefer the unsaturated fats that we find in olive oil, avocados, nuts, flaxseed, fatty fish like salmon, over the processed saturated fats that we'd find in red meat or beef or butter, donuts, those kinds of foods, okay? So we know one's healthier than the other. All of them are going to encourage water. So that's a, that's a whole topic in itself, how much water we need to be drinking. And they're all going to encourage you to avoid, pretty much across the board, the sugary drinks, um, sodas, sweet tea, Kool-Aids, juices, and the likes. So they, there are a lot of things in common. Yes? That's okay. What'd you say? Good question. So there's actually a lot of research to support the health benefits of drinking coffee, but I will say the problem is how people drink their coffee, right? So if you can drink your coffee black, <laughs> so then they would usually say up to 24 ounces a day is, is healthy even. Um, if you have to put a lot of sugar, milk, you know, if these are like the frappes and cappuccinos and things like that from Starbucks and coffee places, then we're really just drinking milkshakes with coffee. Not going to get any health benefits, truly. But otherwise, similar to tea. So, so unsweet tea would be okay for most people. But it's when we do the sweet tea that we get in trouble. What about the stevia? It's a plant-based sugar. Mm -hmm. Good question. So stevia, the question is about stevia. Stevia um, falls into the category of non-nutritive sweeteners, meaning they are not sugar. They do not have carbs or calories. 
It's different than the artificial sweeteners, which would be non-nutritive, but would be things like Splenda equals sweet and low that are more of a chemical structure because stevia is from a plant. The stevia leaf um, is a very, very sweet leaf, and so they found that if they grind it up and process it, then it's, <laughs> just kidding, it's a really sweet powder. Um, so it's not artificial, it's not sugar, but it's pretty relatively new. It's really only become popular over the past five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. So what do you think I'm gonna say? No, yeah, that's the answer, really. We don't know yet. I mean, Splenda is one, just to use as an example, that for a long time came out as the newest sweetener and stop using Equal, everybody used Splenda, everybody switched over to it, and now, 30 years or 40 years later, they're downgrading its safety from use it to caution to avoid it because there's more and more concerns the more research they do. So will Splenda be that in 30 years? It very well might be, sorry, Stevia. Um, it very well might be, we just really don't know. So kind of bottom line for the, the sweetener question in general, if you can train your taste buds, it's hard, but very doable. If you can train your taste buds to not need as much of the sweet taste period, that's gonna be the best thing. Your taste buds really will adjust to it. Um, but if we can move away from the sugary drinks and the diet drinks and the artificial drinks, that's best case scenario. As you're doing that, if you need, if you're someone who's just like, please let me have that one packet of Splenda in my coffee every morning, then the realist in me would say, go ahead. I'm sorry, Dr. Hill. No, that's... <laughs> <laughs> but, but truly, you know, we want, we want to use moderation. But should you use Splenda in everything or Stevia in everything? Well, any of them, I would say no. What about? Um, it doesn't have added sugar. Correct. But it has lots of sugar. It does. So juices in general um, are going to fall into the, the sugar-sweetened beverages. If you're wanting to drink a small amount of orange juice now and then, and you're buying a high-quality one, nobody likes me after this talk, a high-quality one that doesn't have sugar in it, that's probably going to be okay, but here's how I'd encourage you to think of it. Who has squeezed an orange to get orange juice? <clears throat> So you take your orange and you squeeze it, and how much juice do you get? Yeah. So if you want a glass of orange juice, how many do you think we have to squeeze? Like eight, 20, right. So would you, even though oranges are healthy, would you sit down and eat 10 oranges? <clears throat> probably not. Someone said, yeah. <laughs> I like the honesty. Um, probably not, because even though it's healthy, that's still a lot of sugar. So when we take any kind of juice, we really are taking all the sugar from the juice and leaving behind a lot of the fiber and nutrients that come in whole foods. So if you can enjoy an orange, that would be better than the orange juice. Okay. If you're gonna drink orange juice, a serving would be half a cup. Right, I know. Yes. Yeah, we're good. No, we're good. We're at a point that I'm yeah. comfortable if we just have questions, just if you are. I ask as far as like the difference between raw Mm -hmm. And where do baby carrots fall in? Difference in raw and cooked and where baby carrots fall into all vegetables? Like that, no, like, yeah, Those are two questions. two questions. Got it. Um, so with raw and cooked, I'm going to say a, a lot of it is preference. There are people who follow a raw diet. Um, for the most part, when we eat raw foods, we get more of the fiber. Um, we do get a lot of nutrients from them. But if you're lightly cooking, like, like roasting is a good cooking method. If you're steaming, you're still getting a lot of the nutrients. We want to stay away from the other extreme where we like cook them for hours and hours and hours, um, almost down to nothing. We can't, because the fiber is in the plant structure. So the more we do that, we can lose some of the fiber and we're usually cooking it a really long time with you know, processed meats and salt that make it taste good. So probably leaning somewhere closer to the raw or lightly cooked side of things. But I would say of all of the, it's a good question, so I'm not making light of it, but of all of the health questions and concerns you have, I would say eat the vegetables how you enjoy them. Because bottom line, you should be eating more vegetables. If you like them better raw, do it. If you like them steamed, do not worry about steaming your vegetables. Carrots technically fit into the category of non-starchy vegetables, um, as opposed to things like peas, corn, and beans that would fall into the starchy vegetable category. So they're technically non-starchy. A serving would be about a cup. There's lots of health benefits to them. Somewhere along the way, carrots kind of got like a bad rap for being like so high in sugar. They're really not. That was Dr. Perico. Was it? Yes. Ooh. He said to me, Dad, baby. Causes wrinkles, too. He said what? He says it causes wrinkles. Oh, wrinkles. <laughs> 
Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Do you want to answer that one or do you want to? Sure. I'm just going to, while we answer questions, I'm just going to put this slide up so people can look at it as they want to. These are just some takeaway messages. So you can read it as we do questions. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's another controversial topic. When you take a probiotic, you're usually taking one or two types of uh, either bacteria, bacteria or fungi that are normally present in our intestinal tract. Um, but there are billions of different Strange. kinds of bacteria and other organisms that, that are living in our intestinal tracts and we're healthy. So um, taking probiotics, if you, it's, it's better to eat a diet that's mm -hmm. plant-based that gives you a lot of probiotics than to take probiotics. But if you've taken antibiotics recently, mm -hmm. um, there may be some evidence that taking a probiotic supplement could help an, uh, avoid yeast infections and things that sometimes follow antibiotics or diarrhea that sometimes follows uh, ingestion mm -hmm. of diet um, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? I, I, I didn't How hear soon to take the probiotics after the antibiotic? Um, Is it simultaneously? Um, probably it doesn't make a huge difference. Yes. What about um, L-glutamine? L-glutamine. That is an amino acid. Do you have a specific question about it? Well, I read that, I've, I've read a couple of articles that said you should do like five grams times a day to help with um, leaky gut. Does that help? Does that hurt? So that in, it, in itself is going to be, we may not have time to dive into the whole question. Um, leaky gut syndrome kind of falls into the question of inflammation. Um, it's a fairly newer concept if you want to speak to any of that. Um, I am not personally familiar with research saying that across the board individuals should take the um, L-glutamine supplement but more that you need to be following an anti-inflammatory diet in general. There is a really specific diet called the low FODMAP diet that is tailored per an individual based on their tolerance of different chain carbohydrates um, that kind of fits right in with leaky gut. So that would be, if you were interested, it might be something to talk to your doctor, a GI specialist, or a dietitian about, but it's very, very, very individualized to where we really couldn't even answer questions about it in the group setting. Um, but bottom line, I would say, I would not personally recommend that you start taking that supplement right now, um, but would focus more on the, the healthier foods in general. I was thinking about in partnership while I'm making this transition, trying to sure. be able to still add that in. Yeah. Supplements in general are a little iffy just because, number one, there's usually, um, they're, they don't fall under the FDA, so there's not an accrediting body really making sure that they even are what they say they are or that they're safe. They can be rather expensive. So those are all things to consider. Sometimes they absolutely can be helpful, um, but a lot of times aren't necessary. Eat food. <laughs> that's, the, that's the answer. Yes. There is. <laughs> Was there a difference between prebiotics and, and pro probiotics? <laughs> okay. We talked about uh, probiotics. Those are the ones that you eat as a supplement. The prebiotics really are those um, can be f can occur when you eat good food, like plant-based food. They're feeding the intestinal tract with good bacteria and allowing those good bacteria to, to grow and um, um, do the good things that they do. Yep, so think of prebiotics feed the probiotics. The probiotics are the actual bacteria in your GI tract. The prebiotics tend to be the high fiber plant foods. So you, you could take a probiotic all day long, but if you don't eat the plant foods that have prebiotics, we don't have a healthy gut. There's a couple so more questions. I think it is anti-inflammatory. <laughs> cook with turmeric. So, but I cook with it. I know that they've now got you know, yes. pills or capsules. Mm -hmm. Is that just as effective as cooking with 
I don't think, I know you're tired of me saying it, I don't think we have the research yet to say if one is better than the other, but I would say I have no concerns about you using herbs and spices in your cooking. Add as much as you like the taste of or can tolerate. You're not gonna go overboard there. There's gonna be no risk. A supplement, I mean, we don't know what form it is. We don't know where that supplement's breaking down in your GI tract, if it's doing any good or not. But across the board, usually turmeric, um, garlic, ginger, curry. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Coriander. I mean, all going to be anti-inflammatory spices. All the spices have been shown to be uh, very health healthy, mm -hmm. and it tastes good makes question. food taste good. <laughs> So that's one that we didn't quite have time to get to today, but it's as simple as this picture shows you. It's a way to rearrange the food on your plate that's going to help with general health, but also weight management. So I use this a lot with people who want to eat really healthy but are trying to lose weight. You'll notice kind of when we talked about the southern plate, it is very different. So lining up with the Mediterranean diet, half of your plate, what you base the meal around is going to be the non-starchy vegetables. So broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, string beans, carrots, onions, peppers, celery, cucumbers, squash, all of it. Majority of that, um, if you protein then um, would be a quarter of the plate, that could be plant or animal based, and then your complex carbs would be instead of the starch and it is a smaller amount. So that is kind of what the plate method meant. We'll be here afterwards too if you had more questions about that. So we just didn't have time to get to that one tonight. All right. So what are the, yes. oh I was just going to say. What are the obstacles to eating healthy? I mean, we all know what the healthy foods are, but. It's boring. Come to our house. It's not boring. <laughs> I guarantee. But more importantly, it's time. Yeah. Yeah. And I opt to go with the potatoes mm -hmm. and your uh, cake pops, you know, and yeah. I just went the opposite way. So, and I mean, you know, because I, I, I'm in a lot of different groups, and yeah. mainly my church group. Absolutely. And so if we're having a pizza outing or something, mm -hmm. and I come with a, a handful of nuts. You know, <laughs> They're looking at you like you're crazy. So, right. So That's hard. <laughs> well, and, and that's good. To that, to that, I would say a couple of things. No one thinks it's, it's not easy, but number one, if you think back to the Mediterranean diet, that's part of the reason it's built on that healthy social relationship because it's a lot harder to do it on your own yeah. than with support. So number one, find at least a couple people who will support you in that, not the sabotagers who try to give you their pizza, right? right. But number two, <laughs> this is where, you know, as this really isn't like a plug, but as a resource, if you seek out just talking with your doctor about it or a dietitian, having extra support can be helpful because yeah. it is difficult. Yeah. But, but your question about time is, is another issue. It does take time to cook good food. Um, Yeah, but um, make that cooking a, an experience that where you're maybe cooking with somebody else and you're chatting and, and you're having a good time and you're thinking about all the, the nutrients in the food. It, 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 can, it makes it worth it. Yeah, there we go. And one thing I, what'd you say? Color, yeah. And so going off the, the question of the time or the challenges, I would also just encourage everyone, maybe even as kind of as we're wrapping up, you guys have had great questions, and a lot of those questions are about the theoretical questions, the what's the very best thing to do question. So we've tried to give that information, but don't let that overwhelm you in a sense that it keeps you from making what is a realistic change for you. So if leaving here tonight you feel like, I don't have an hour and a half to cook a gourmet vegan dinner. Don't let that stop you from saying, okay, but I am going to cook a second vegetable with dinner tomorrow night. Or I am going to make my portion of the meat a little bit smaller and eat more of the vegetables. So take the big picture, let it encourage you and motivate you, be inspired and excited, but also 
be realistic and keep taking those small steps because they will add up to change over time. So don't be overwhelmed. If, don't be paralyzed by the, the information. Well, when you get tired of being fat like me, you just have to do something. So. <laughs> <laughs> and you're here. <laughs> We should. We should clap. Yeah. All right. I'm going to say um, we can, I think we can stay another hour. I think so.